um, quinoa has become very popular because um, not only is it a grain, but it is a protein. It is 98% protein. So it's sort of, I, I tease my man, it's the man of the grain. <laughs> it's so good. You can use it in so many things. You can even grind it for flour. Um, but when you're using it for flour, um, you can replace, if you're using um, like a cup of flour and you want to add quinoa, then you can only use a fourth of a cup. So three fourths of a cup of other kind of flour and one fourth of a cup of quinoa. Mm -hmm. But in, if you use more, then you're going to get a distinctive quinoa flavor anyway. But I have made quinoa where it's half and half for bread. It's very good. But it's good for like, um, you can put it in soups, you can use it as rice. Um, any dishes that you use rice, you can use quinoa. Um, you can use it for um, cereal, it tastes really good, just to cook it and put it in the Or you can spice it up and put, use it with um, Chinese or Thai food or even Mexican dishes. Um, the white quinoa is probably more popular and you see a lot, you can even buy it in like five pound bags at like Costco. But the red quinoa, you will have to look for it. It has a little um, harder shell to it, and so it has a little more crunch and chew to it. But you will know when it's done, when it's cooked, because it kind of like puffs open, and so it has a little distinctive white and white around it. Oh, yeah, this is perfect. This is even one. Um, people do it on top of the stove, but my favorite way is just to do it in a rice cooker. It's just like, there's no water, and you know, just like rice. Um, the uh, next grain I'm going to talk about is, oh, you can, I was going to say, you can use it in cookies and soups and all kinds of things. I even put it in dry, like after I've cooked it. I don't put butter on it. I just cook it dry with a little bit of salt, and we add it to salads. It makes, you can use it instead of couscous or um, little wheat. I made it like um, taboo. So, I'm just going to add this. I'm just going to ask about shelf life. Um, you can store it up to eight years. Long yes. Um, the next I'm going to talk about is spelt. And the only reason I'm going to add spelt is it is a type of meat. Actually, it's one of the original type of meats. Um, there's so many people that have um, allergies or problems with meat nowadays. But the original grains are, you find in the Bible, is humor and spelt. And they grew wild, and when people settled down into villages, they would grow it closer to their village, so they started cultivating. And somehow they cross-bred them until we now have what we call wheat. So it was, it was the first genetically modified grain. Right. The reason we, they like wheat better, and it's used industrial, is because the way the wheat grows, as the wool. Things in the little tassel on the top, these grains are the same. But when you thrash it, wheat, all that comes off the wheat kernel so much easier than spelt or emer. But emer and spelt are called farro, F A R R O, by the Italians. And that's what they grow. That's the grain that they grow. No, farro's not this time, sorry. <laughs> um, or is it? Is farro mustard? Yeah, so it's yes. next time. Oh, I got ahead. I got out of sync. Sorry. Got to that. <laughs> uh, the Italians say that farro tastes much better, makes a much better pasta. <coughs> and they use it in all their breads and grains and soups. It's basically the only grain they put on, which is kind of nice. So if you're a good thing, you have a wheat allergy. Go ahead, eat the pasta and eat the bread because you're all allergies. Um, the shelf life is very much like wheat, just like wheat. You can't use it in place of wheat the same. Um, when it's ground, I think it has a lighter texture to it, but cup by cup, it cooks the same in breads, cookies, pastries. So I don't notice the difference that way. Um, any questions about that? Yeah. yeah. Over uh, wheat, which one would be the most nutritious and most beneficial? Actually, 
spelled with a fair has more nutrition in it, it's high fiber food, but it actually has more protein content than meat does. And also it's been genetically modified so many times that that's why people are having more protein. Um, and they use Still, we were just, it's easy for them to grow. I think that's why the Italian is so good. They still grow in Ethiopia, too. And well, I guess it's easy to grow because they're just down there. So, what works? Yes? Oh, spelt? You know what? Spelt, you can find whole grain um, and you can find the flower. The flower is available at like Winco, um, Holy Green. Um, Um, the time is called Hamer and Spell Pharaoh, which is the wild brain, so they refer to both of them as that. Um, I wrote it by the 25 pound bag, but didn't have it. Now, you can't go, yes, there's barley. Barley's interesting. <laughs> barley is, um, usually think of barley in when you put it in soups or stews. So when you go to the store, you're going to look for barley by the beans and the lentils, because that's what it's used for. <laughs> but 98% um, of all barley never makes it to your soup or stews, because it's used for animal feed, or malt, or <laughs> And so, but it is very good for, um, it has a very good nutritional value. I just want to it has a, a soluble fiber, so it makes it good for um, people with coronary disease or high cholesterol. It helps lower low cholesterol. And it's also good for barley water. It's good for kidneys and um, arthritis and rheumatoid problems. So it has a lot of beneficial things. It has a lot um, Barley is the same as rice. You can use it in place of rice. It, it, it has the same chewy flavor as rice does. It has a little nuttier flavor. You just um, sometimes uh, there's a difference between hulled and pearl barley. Sometimes the hull takes longer to cook. So maybe it's a bit more pearl barley. They also have quick cooking barley, and it doesn't lose any nutritional value. So look for that. And our handout that we'll email you later has some um, more information on what we use and how to cook it, cut the cup, and, and things like that. Um, it can reduce uh, type 2 diabetes. And it, um, one cup of barley is only 193 calories, so it's very, very low in fat. They say it's a low fat grain. Be back there. It has uh, barley, red wheat, and um, we'll, we'll talk about oh, goats. Right. So you'll you'll taste you'll taste yeah, it with that. Anyway. It works really well. But if you make chest barley bread, it would be pretty flat because <laughs> it doesn't have the gluten. Yes, but for some people, that's good. Millet, millet, interesting grain. 
Most of the time we see birds in here in the U.S. <laughs> it's a little tiny yellow bit. Oh, she's got it. It's tiny. You can see how tiny they are up here. Um, but yet it is a, it's still a living staple in India, which is interesting. It's been used before there was rice in China and the Himalayas and some of those Asian countries. They were using millet. Millet is one of the most expensive grains you can buy. And I like it. It has kind of a, to me, it has a slightly corn flavor to it. So I always used it in my home with Mexican food instead of corn. You know, instead of rice, we use, we cook millet. And um, you can spice it up a little or just serve it alongside your spicy food to calm it down. <laughs> so. But you can also use it in soups and things. Um, some people like to just cook it and then mash it. It's so tiny anyway that mashing it is kind of silly. But um, you can also grind it and use it as well also. Um, many times you can like roast it in pan before you cook it and give it more flavor, <coughs> to good flavor. Um, you can add it to other things like different breads. And you will find when you're reading labels that sometimes you will find that no is in there as it can be used as a form, because it's an inexpensive grain. Um, but it is high in magnesium, niacin, phosphorus, potassium, and it does have a content of protein. So. And the shelf life is like quinoa, it's about eight years. The last one that we just found is black rice. Um, we're just going to, or did I, did we get along? No, I didn't have a slide. We don't have a slide, but, but it's up here. Um, long, yes, you can speak out of long rice right there. Mm -hmm. uh, black rice looks more like rice. It's a tiny rice. Um, it's also called forbidden rice or emperor's rice. And the reason I want to mention it is it is high in antioxidants. It's up there with acai berries and blueberries. Mm. It's very high. It has a really sweet flavor. Sometimes I use like half black rice to half brown rice and make it a little like confetti rice. And the reason I like the black rice is it doesn't bleed its black color or blue color into the brown rice when I cook it. They stay separate, which is unusual because sometimes you'll get a red rice or something will bleed everything red. Black rice stays black and then and rice is still nice and good. So that is a very nice color. Um, because it's high in nutrition, when you, when you cook it like, you just cook it like rice. Two cups, and a cup of rice, two cups of water. In a rice cooker on the stove. Um, it loses a little nutritional value when you cook it that way. So if you want to keep the nutritional value, you can um, grind it and put the flour in like breakfast shakes, sprinkle it on your salads or put it in things like that and then you're going to have that high nutrition of, um, the high protein of the nutrition content. Um, I didn't find a long bit that last, it's probably the same as any other rice though. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. I would say keep it like brown rice because it was a whole grain. Right. So I would say probably somewhere around the lines of brown rice. I'll have to tell you, I serve it when company comes, just plain black rice. And people are like, what's this? And then they just they go, oh my gosh, this is so good. Where'd you find this? Because it, it does, it has such a good, sweet, nice flavor. This is so, also something you can find it. You know, a lot of these grains you can find it. Yeah. This one will be in the little cool down ones at the top. They have a lot of, that's where you find um, the quinoa too, is the ones that are high. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about buckwheat. How many of you guys have already eaten something with buckwheat in it before? Okay, we have some people familiar. This is actually really well known in buckwheat pancakes. Is that how you guys have eaten it? Actually, in our state cookbook, there is a really fun 
buckwheat pancakes recipe that I figure tastes pretty good since it made it into the cookbook. Somebody likes it, right? So if you haven't tried it, you can try the one in the state cookbook. Um, I think it's from the Quartz Hill Ward. Um, so buckwheat is actually um, not necessarily a grain. Uh, it's so this actually does not have any gluten. So if you have gluten sensitivities, you can use buckwheat um, because this is actually from the rhubarb family. Uh, and this is this particular grain has a very odd shape. It looks like a little pyramid. I have some up here you guys can come and look at. Most of the time you find it ground up, but these are the growths. As groats, you can make porridge, you know, kind of with oatmeal, steel cut oatmeal, but you can make that out of buckwheat. Um, and it's, it has a very distinctive flavor, so when you try a buckwheat, I don't know if this is working. Can you guys hear me? No, I'm probably turned it off. Is, it off. is that better? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Well, I'll talk loud. <laughs> I have a pretty loud voice. I have two children that scream a lot, so I can talk loud. Um, but buckwheat also is known for its high iron and B vitamin contents. So it's really a nice grain to incorporate into your food. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people use it as flour. Um, so you can put it in some of your bread, put it, make pancakes occasionally with it, and it's really a nice addition. Now this one actually has some of the longer shelf lives of our different grains. This one actually is 15 years, uh, which is longer than, of course, the quinoa at eight years and millet and things like that. Um, next slide. Wild rice. We kind of touched on this. I wanted to talk about it, even though the last month was on rice. Yeah, sure. Even though last month was on rice, I wanted to talk about it. Oh, look. You got it. I think that's how this has been. <laughs> I know that for filming it's easier and you guys don't want to hear the screen. So, um, wild rice I wanted to talk about, even though we're quite familiar with rice, um, mainly because it's, it's a little different. It's actually not in the rice family. Uh, and it's grown here in the United States mostly, in North America and in northern parts of North America in lakes, so the Great Lakes region, things like that, is where you grow most of your wild rice. Um, wild rice is a whole grain. It has a little bit different flavor. Um, so this isn't, this is like the similar to kind of the brown rice in nutrition. Um, and, oh dear, sorry. <laughs> and it's easy to incorporate because it can replace your normal rice very easily. It does have a deeper, richer flavor, so don't expect it to taste like white rice. It just won't. But it's really fun. It also has the same kind of color pop that we were talking with the forbidden rice. Adds a little bit of nutrition, you know, that you might not get through your wheat and oats and normal grains. Okay, the next slide. Okay, and so now we have two of probably the ones that most of you have not heard of. How many of you have heard of amaranth or teff? Oh my goodness, you guys are so on call. I didn't even know. Um, so we have amaranth first. Um, it's actually a South American green. This is actually from the Aztecs. And so it's ancient, ancient. And they used it in a lot of their religious worship at that time. And so when the Spaniards came in and started colonizing South America, they were trying to reduce the um, religion, you know, which was kind of pagan. They were trying to reduce it, so they outlawed amaranth, and so you couldn't use it. And of course, it stayed around a little bit in like the offshoots, and it's kind of started coming back. Since about the 70s, they started really bringing it out. And I guess I read an article, it was in 19, 1977, article. Um, amaranth was described as the of the future. And so the reason why it's the crop of the future, there were four reasons he listed. It was easy to harvest, super easy to harvest. You know, and it just grows wild, kind of. Um, it's a great source of protein. This one is very similar to a quinoa and how much protein, and it contains lysine, which is actually one of the things that in other grains you don't have. 
That's the reason why they always tell you to go and eat beans and rice to get your complete protein, you know, it's to get that lysine. And that's the reason why you have peanut butter and jelly, you know, as the American substitute for beans and rice. And so that's, but in this particular drink, as well as in quinoa, you have that lysine protein, I mean, amino acid that you need in your diet. And so you can get it from here or from the quinoa, and it's really helpful. So if you incorporate this into your diet, you don't have to worry about eating meat if you don't want to. You know, most of you probably want to eat some meat, but you don't have to when you incorporate all of these types of grain. Um, this one actually is about, th this doesn't have quite as high of a protein content as quinoa. This is about 30% more than rice, but it's not up to the 90%, you know, plus quinoa, or the quinoa. <coughs> this is also easy to cook, and if you come up here, you can see that you can pop it. This is a very, very tiny, tiny grain right here. You can come up and look at it. Um, and you can pop it, so it's kind of like Barbie popcorn. You can have little tea grains like Barbie popcorn. Um, so you guys can come up and look. It's starting to brown up, so I don't know if you want to taste it because it might be a little burnt, but you can try it if you want to. Um, and the last one I'm going to talk about is teff. And teff is actually the the easiest to grow of all of the ones we talked about. Um, this is actually one of the easiest that they grow. It, you can grow it in the desert, you can grow it in the water, you can grow it, it doesn't die. And they mainly grow it in Ethiopia. Uh, and it's kind of starting to make its way here um, to the United States and people are starting to incorporate it into their diet. Um, and one of the reasons why this plant, I mean you can see how tiny these seeds are. That's a full penny, and they're itty bitty. You can see them right here, I have a darker version. And come up and look, so you can see exactly how tiny these are. Um, but these are easy to, to cook up. I mean, they're so small, they don't take that long. You can pop these as well. You can put them into your granola or sprinkle them on top of something else. Um, but this one, actually, the interesting thing about eating teff is it has an extremely high calcium content. Extremely high. So if you eat a cup of cooked teff, it's the same calcium content you get from eating half a cup of cooked spinach. I mean, it's really high. You can't get that from most grains, the calcium level. This also contains vitamin C, which is also very special to grains, because most grains do not have vitamin C. But this one does. So if you're ever stuck on a ship, you know, hmm. where you don't have your oranges, eat some teff and you'll not get scurvy or anything. Um, so this one actually, also, since this is in Ethiopia, yes? All these small grains, do they have to be cooked or can they just be sprinkled on salads and stuff? I don't see why they can't be sprinkled on salads. I mean, they're not too hard or anything. Come up and try them. You know, just crunch on a few and see if you like it. I think that it's easier to eat, you know, but it's not any more than, like, this is smaller than poppy seeds, right? And you eat poppy seeds whole. So you could probably sprinkle this on top and put it on top of, when you're cooking bread even, just sprinkle it on top where you would poppy seeds in the middle. You know, sprinkle some teff, and you get some different types of, you know, you get calcium you can through, through the grain. Um, but this one has, we were talking about different kinds of starches and how it, how it processes. Teff is really high in resistant starch, so it actually helps um, your digestive system. And they're kind of it's, they're learning about this um, in resilient or resistant starch, and so it helps with blood sugar management. It helps with weight control, colon health, and has a dietary fiber that you need um, just with this little tiny grain that you can add to just about anything. Um, and it, I was reading that a lot of Ethiopian runners. You know, they get all these medals for running, huh. and they they actually say that it's because they eat teff. Um, and teff has, you don't, I, I couldn't find any definitive information about long-term storage because it's fairly new to our diets and keeping it in our food storage. But I would say probably about eight years, which is about the same as the others, um, you can switch it out. But if you're talking about long-term storage, you need your vitamin C. You need these things in your diet. And so having multiple types of greens 
is really important if you are living off of the grains in your food storage. If you only had brown rice and wheat to live off of, you couldn't do it. That's like eating broccoli every day of your life, and that's it. You don't have all the nutrients in just one type of grain. So when they say get 400, you know, 400 pounds of grain, yeah, get 400 pounds of grain for your year per person, but get it in multiple grains. Get some, some quinoa in there. Keep it for eight years. Get some teff. Get some wild rice or buckwheat. Or, you know, get a variety of these different kinds of grains and incorporate it. And then I think the next slide can go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, go back. So I was just going to tell you one quick thing. If all of this is really intense, all these different types of grains and understanding this, an easy way to incorporate it is there's something wonderful that you can find a lot of bulk food, like bulk and food or something. It's called a seven grain mix or a nine grain mix, right? I mean, everybody's seen those on the list. They're cracked nine grain, and they don't they don't have teff in it or amaranth. Um, I wrote down in the nine grain mix that you can get from. Walton feed. It has wheat, barley, oats, corn, millet, flaxseed, whole barley, rye. So it has a number of different types of grains that can help in when you're living off your food storage. And that's a really easy thing. A lot of these things can be ground into flour. You can put it just into your breads, just your normal bread recipes. Substitute about a fourth of what it's called for. So a fourth of a cup to a cup, you know, kind of thing. Um, and you can substitute something and it increases its protein, it increases its other vitamins. The nine grain, you can also grind up. That can be put into something. You can make this easily as breakfast. My husband loves to make the nine grain cereal for breakfast. Uh, you know, as porridge, you just put it in the water. You can even throw it in dry without even grinding it up with your bread. Let's say you make a bread recipe. It's almost at the end of your bread recipe, you're needing, you know, just mixing in the last year of flour. Throw in a half a cup of your nine grain mix, you know, your cracked nine grain, and it gives you a nice texture in your bread, and you still get a little bit of these other grains. And that way you can just incorporate more and get more vitamins and nutrients. Now, Tamara's going to come up and talk about how to get some different kinds of nutrients other than what we talked about through sprouting and soaking grains. Anyways, I like all the grains.
it breaks down the phytic acid, and it also is a, it's, it's like a power punch of vitamins when you sprout. So there's more vitamins in the grain uh, than if you just use the whole grain itself. And what I've done, um, these are grains, these are a little sprouted too much, and so I wouldn't use it for the bread, because once the grain is sprouted um, longer than the grain itself, you can kind of fill up, then it makes your bread really dark. So you want just a tiny little sprout on it. And um, instead of grinding flour, this is how I make my bread now. I soak my grains, and then I start them to sprout. And then I have a meat grinder, but you can use a food processor. And it just takes these uh, grains. recipes yeah. in the handout that we send to you by email that has you know, some more information or we can if you don't get email you know contact Debbie Kent and she'll have it and she'll have specific instructions on some of this mm -hmm. yeah um, the recipe that I used altered a little bit was from sproutpeople.org in fact I have three recipes that I use uh, sproutpeople.org it's a very good resource for sprouting I found almost every bit of information I needed there Okay, and then a um, few other um, grains that I did. Barley, I got the whole barley, and I found it at weedery, the whole weedery. But um, it's for sprouting, so it's in a little tiny bag. So uh, if anyone knows where I get 25 pounds, uh, yes? Look, what's that? A uh, windfall, the whole or the pearl? Okay. Because um, I haven't been able to find the whole barley. They're starting to sprout. And I'm going to grow my barley because it's, I find it very difficult to get the whole, but I always find the pearl. Um, I've started some brown rice. Um, uh, radish. A radish has the, the radish seeds, which start sprouting in. They have a, a bite to them, just like a radish does. They taste really good. Um, the radish and broccoli and um, alfalfa are really good salad mixes. And, to sprout on your sandwiches. My sprouts 
aren't as far along as I was hoping them to be. But um, let's see, we've got some oak roads and uh, quinoa, uh, sprouts of quinoa. And uh, once, um, once they get sprouting, they're really good. I mean, just like any sprouts, you put sprouts on sandwiches and stuff, they, they will get that far. They just haven't yet. Um, one funny one was uh, chia. You know the chia heads? Yeah. <laughs> they have chia seeds <laughs> that, that um, you can sprout. But I was going along and just starting to sprout it like I would sprout any other seed. And I got this muck of stuff and it's moldy. I have to look at it every time. Mucilaginous, no, mucilaginous, and yeah, mucilaginous. So I was trying to drain it, and it was just wouldn't drain, and so and so I tried it again, and you know, crazy. But um, then I went and I researched on sproutpeople.org, and um, there's a few of them: flaxseed, uh, chia, and um, arugula. That's another one. Um, you have to sprout them in different ways, either on some kind of a cloth. Um, they suggest like just a bed of, of um, dirt, you know, just a bed of regular sprouting stuff, dirt. And they finally, I have sprouts from Chia. <laughs> I, I worked on this for a very long time, and it was very frustrating. And um, the flax is starting to go too. So, um, on all of those types, yes? Have you sprouted mung beans? Yes, I have mung beans right here, and mung beans are in one of the salads that I might have. Oh, they tasted very good. Oh, they're yummy. In fact, you can go ahead and sample some of these. They taste like those fre just fresh peas to me. So you can find mung beans already sprouted at the store. It'll just be in a bag of mung bean sprouts. It's normally in the Asian food section of the store because they put it a lot in um, Chinese stir cooking and stir fries. Yep. So, and there's some of that back there as well. Um, you know that, I don't know if you guys ever went to one of those juice bars and you got a shot of wheatgrass. <coughs> Anyone ever do that? I was like, yeah. <laughs> when I lived in San Diego, I was like, oh, you've got to try this. It tasted really bad. I mean, it tastes like grass. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you like grass, fine. But the vitamins that are in there, I mean, it's a, it's a really powerful bunch of vitamins. And um, anyways, you pay two, three dollars for this little tiny shot of wheatgrass, you can grow it yourself. In fact, I've got my greens starting and I'm really excited because I'm just going to keep this in my window and I have a juicer at home. I'm going to make my own wheatgrass shots. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's a, a fun way to, um, to get some of your vitamins. Um, any questions on, so we talked about sorry, oh, sorry. the vitamins and the digestion. When, when you sprout grains, like whole wheat, some people have uh, wheat allergies. Um, the sprouting process breaks down that phytic acid. It um, also helps aid in digestion, and people with allergies sometimes are okay with that, depending on how well it's sprouted and so So you can get around those allergies. Okay. Um, soup, salad, sandwiches, and um, snacks. I made a hummus out of. Uh, I sprouted the garbanzo beans. I cheated and I had to use a can of um, gar garbanzo beans as well as the sprouted ones um, because I needed the juice and I didn't want to just add water. It sounded it seemed weird, so so I cheated a little bit of hummus, but mostly yeah, it is sprouted uh, uh, garbanzo beans. And um, like a pasta, there was a pasta salad dish with with um, split is it that's black eyed peas sprouted and pasta, and it looked really good. And uh, so pastas, salads, um, all different kinds. And any soups, they, so it's just throw them in. In fact, I was gonna, my husband <coughs> doesn't know, sometimes I'll grind this up and I'll just add it to the beef when I'm cooking spaghetti or something. And it adds, you know, the fiber and stuff. So, so he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I talked about soaking, like I said, a year ago. If you're gonna, if you want to try and soak flour, what you do is you you grind your wheat, and then you would soak the wheat overnight. Um, a lot of us use use food storage, so any of the water, like I would use my powdered eggs and all that the next morning, but I would add the water and buttermilk the night before, so it would soak the flour, and then you just add the powdered stuff the next day, and it made a pretty good bread. It was really good, and. Um, Oh, 
we did very it's about to end. So any questions? Most of these um, sprouts came from the whole weedery. Um, the alfalfa seeds I got from the malt and water. And they come in big bags rather than these little tiny bags that you get at, you know, for five and ten dollars. So so you can find things cheaper other other places. But. Oh, a couple other, sorry. The way I was um you don't need a sprouter, you don't need a fancy sprouter, they do have the lids at um, the whole weedery. And I found this, I don't know where, but dollar store, I found it later, and I would just rinse it like that and make sure I put it in the bowl and make sure it drinks really well and you know just move on to the next one. Because I was doing so many, this worked out really well. Or you can just use a cheesecloth and a rubber band. So you don't need a fancy sprouter. In fact, this is the first time I've used anything. Um, like those. And then there's these uh, Sprout Masters. I have the radish and broccoli here. They sprouted a little bit more. And there's my first attempt, oh no, my fourth attempt at chia seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and here's my alfalfa sprouts. I really like these alfalfa sprouts. They're very, uh, very good for you. The broccoli is, um, has cancer. It doesn't have cancer. Cancer fight. No, cancer fight. Okay. Cancer fighting. Um, there's something about it that helps fight the cancer or it helps you to avoid it. And um, I think that's about it. Anything else? <laughs> so hopefully you guys have learned a little bit more about the different greens that we have um, available here locally and things you can order um, through Walton Feed or you know, on the internet or something like that. Now I did want to say, because I use chia seeds a lot, but I don't sprout them. They have more omega-3, um, new oil or omega-3, um, no, it's not oil, but acids, amino acids, um, than flaxseed does, and you don't have to grind them to eat them. So actually, without even sprouting, you can sprinkle them in your smoothies or on your cereal or on anything, and you get a lot of your omega-3s. Chia seeds, um, and you can always remember chia seeds. To chia. There is a danger with chia seeds if you are on high blood pressure medication. Mm -hmm. It increases your blood pressure. Oh, okay. So, so that's good to know. Yeah, I yeah. I was doing it in my husband's and we his blood pressure kept going kept higher and higher. higher. <laughs> I thought, oh. Okay. No chia seeds if you're on blood pressure medication. Medication. <laughs> it has something in it that reacts with medication. Right. Right. Okay, that's really good to know. Um, but yeah, so it's really interesting to see all the different kinds of sprouting, different kinds of ways you can use all these grains. It's it, you can, it's just your imagination. You know, really just try it and see if it works for you. Just when you're walking through the store, if you see a different grain, pick it up and, you know, try it out. Um, one of the things I was going to show you about grinding, um, I took it off of the slide presentation, but most of, a lot of people have full-on meat grinders and they can grind all of the grains, including the little, if you have a you know an impact grinder, you can grind, uh, grind all of the ones that we showed you here. Once you sprout them, you need to make sure and use a different kind of um, grinding. Um, and but with all the dry grains before you sprout them, you can um, <laughs> grind all of them. And one of the ways I grind some of these is through a coffee grinder. Sorry, I have to um, And so I just bought one of these at, I don't know, Walmart or Target or something. People use them a lot to grind up their herbs. If you have rosemary in the backyard, you can use it. Just pop the lid off, put in your grains or your herbs, and then you grind it up in here, and it does the same as your big meat grinder. So if you're using quinoa and you only want a fourth of a cup, Rather than hauling out everything, you just pick up your little coffee grinder and you grind it up really fast and it works really well. Um, anybody have any questions overall of what we talked about? Yes? How many grains can you use in, in the storm grind? There's still a lot of storm grinds, right? It's and true. Everything you said, book you read will say you stone ground flour. Yes, well, stone ground, I mean, it gives you a different texture and it takes a lot more work sometimes depending on what kind of stone grinder you have. 
But anything that you can grind with impact grinder, you can grind with stone grinder. Uh, but you can grind more in a stone grinder than you can with impact. You can grind more things. You can grind more things with oils and seeds and things like that in some of the stone and the hand mills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can't do it in stone? Well, I'm just thinking the hand grinders. You can you can do seeds and things in hand grinders, but you do not want to put seeds in an impact grinder. So that would be your K-Tech, you know, electric grinder, you know, or a wonder mill or anything like that, or a whisper mill. You don't want to put any kinds of seeds in there. So if you're going to grind a flat seed, don't do it. <laughs> But any of the grains up here, you can put into your in, into your you know grinders or anything like that. Right. I just think that the coffee grinder is one of the things that most people haven't heard of, especially in this class, and it's really helpful when you're talking about smaller grains and littler you know smaller portions that you're grinding. Uh, and so, anybody else have any questions? Yes. What is it? Forbidden rice. It's forbidden rice. Why do they call it forbidden? It's actually, it was the history behind it in, um, in China, where it has come from, and just that certain people were forbidden to eat it, because it was special for them. So it was called forbidden rice because of the history. But other than that, it's also called wok rice. So, any other questions? Okay, well, hopefully you guys have all learned a little bit more, and you can incorporate a few more grains and follow the counsel that you find in Doctrine and Covenants of all grains being ordained for our use. And so hopefully we can improve our health and, uh, and have interesting lives by trying these <laughs> different kinds of grains. So come up and look at these and we have some food in the back for you guys to taste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.